Today is December 16th, 2011. I'm Bill Latanzi, and today, as part of the MIT 150 Infinite History Project, we are speaking with Vladimir Bulevich, Professor of Electrical Engineering, the Director of MIT's Microsystems Technology Laboratories, and a McVicker Faculty Fellow, an award that recognizes MIT faculty who have made exemplary and sustained contributions to the teaching and education of undergraduates at the Institute. Welcome, Professor Bulevich, and thank you for speaking with us. My pleasure to be here. You've said in other interviews you're trying to train the next generation of leaders and that at MIT we know how to do this. And I'm sure there's a lot of interest. How, how do you train the next generation of leaders? What's, what's the method? <laughs> it's very easy, actually, at MIT. You start with extremely good material, which is our students. Uh, uh, you know, in many ways, universities pride themselves by uh, being able to provide exceptionally good education. And yeah, indeed, as faculty, we try to offer the best class we can. MIT, I think, excels in that. But that's, I don't think, uh, most of the education the student gets when they get to MIT. I think most of the education the student gets is from their peers. The fact that on the undergrad level, it's really the dorm room uh, or it is the uh, dining hall that most of the experiences that will shape you will, um, will be given to you. And the good thing about it is that you are surrounded by incredible other young people full of enthusiasm who see the future that maybe a little vaguely, but certainly with you in conversation will discover what needs to be done next. So we start with extremely good raw material. And then uh, the best we can do is excite them. I mean, show them what makes us excited about the world we see ahead of us. Uh, we have uh, maybe a little more perspective than they do. We've seen more as faculty. But uh, they're the ones who need to do the work. So they're the ones who will inherit it and you know, take on and define the next set of milestones. Uh, for us is to tell them a few first few we see and see if they can achieve them and then ho learn from them as well on what is it that we might have been missing uh, and their youthfulness and charisma and daring of exploring new things uh, you know, often you know you find it at a great deal of inspiration on what you should really be thinking of as a faculty so you find um, young people coming at it with a fresh eye inevitably are seeing things in a new way yeah, often in a very misguided way, and, <laughs> and which is wonderful, because uh, once in a while you stop and you say, well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not so misguided. Maybe this is not an entirely crazy way to think about it. And in that, you inject a little bit of your own wisdom that you might have gained through the years and realize, oh, maybe, you know, I never would have thought of doing that, but since it's suggested, let me try. I, on the undergrad level, I see that. On the undergrad level, I see that raw enthusiasm. On the graduate level, uh, there is a... a uh, already a semi-formed personality, uh, someone who already has a great deal of investment, or at least passion, that they feel they want to make the best solar cells, they want to make the best light bulbs, they want they want to save the world in this or that way, and that's wonderful. What what I often love to do, well, what I think is important to do uh, with individuals like that is maintain their enthusiasm with a dose of reality, if possible. Uh, I often start by uh, challenging their notions, not to be contrarian, but only to point to the practica practicality of some of the challenges. Uh, if I'm going to talk about solar cells, I'm going to go ahead and save the world with solar technologies, right? That's what I want to do. Well, that's a great idea. You know, I'm, I'm a director of the Solar Frontier Center. I, I truly believe in it as well. But you know, you know, uh, it will take me a long time to make enough solar cells to truly make a difference. And you can ask, how long will it be? Well, you know. If I put down solar cells as fast as I can put down roads, it will take 10 years, 11, to reach 10% of electricity needs of US. So give me 100 years of deploying solar cells, and maybe I'll be able to reach you know, that goal of truly making a difference, and only if you have a battery technology that goes with it that doesn't exist as of today. So that doesn't mean that I want to quench their enthusiasm, but I do like to give them that dose of reality so that the next thing they think of will solve you know, that battery issue or will solve the deployment issue that right now truly is the Achilles heel of the technology. And what you often find is you pose a problem like that and the students just fly with it. They come up with extremely innovative ways of completely rethinking the whole concept of why is this done or that done. They're, they're, they're problem solvers. You know, they lay out a big vision and then start solving problems. In many ways. I mean, you know, the. Uh, 
I, I'm a electrical engineering professor, so uh, the students I see are very much hands-on students. Um, all of that is rooted in theory. So often what I find are the best solutions are the ones that are willing to go ahead and try out stuff. But at the same time, students who step back and ask themselves, how come the world is this way? And jot stuff on the paper, do a bit of analysis, model, mm -hmm. and then recognize that the first experiment was faulty or not complete for some reason based on the numerical work they just done, and then propose the second thing to do, implement it again, get part, part way there, fail in some ex respects, only to again learn what to do yet again. So that persistence and you know in, in discovery is extremely important. In the in the humanities, Samuel Beckett says um, his method is uh, or, or character says um, fail, try again, fail better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. So, so y you said that it also that it's key for students to know the difference between science and technology, and I wonder if this taps into what you're talking about now. And I just want to ask the simple question. What's the difference, and, <laughs> and why don't students know it? <laughs> I, I think I think many of the faculty don't know it, and I think m much of the world doesn't know it. I mean, in it's it's uh, it's pervasive. It's pervasive to recognize that um, we don't really appreciate where one stops and the other one starts. And you know, the way I look at my work and is very much to try to link the two. I, I like to make something that is useful, broadly useful. Yet I'm a nanoscientist, you know, I'm a nanotechnologist, I'm an electrical engineer for goodness sake, and yet I'm willing to use the word science in what I do. That's because it's integral to everything that we do. It's all about how the world is down on the nanoscale that will enable me to give you a, a yard by yard square sheet of something. Is it a solar cell or a display or a chemo sensor or a skin or whatever it is? And so being able to link the two and recognize when one starts, the other one stops and there's there's no clear boundary, right? I mean, I need to know the basic science, and when I'm down on a, on on uh, using my pencil and scribbling stuff down or typing a code to model this, that's science. And then I go ahead and try it out. Well, am I now doing engineering or technology? Well, not really. I'm just testing the science. I'm doing you know generating a test bed to examine the idea, and then what next? Well, the next thing to do is actually to make something that actually works and test does it work very well. So am I doing science or engineering? Well, often both. Often at that point, I'm turning on the, my little LED to see the light bulb glow, and, and I say, well, it's glowing. This is great. I can give this to someone else to start using it. But you know, it's not glowing quite bright enough. It's not quite as efficient. Why is that? Well, now I'm back in science. So <laughs> it's, it's this feedback that enables you at the end to make something that's truly worthwhile, at least in my own experience. And if it ever becomes just purely one or the other, it's a wonderful endeavor. It's a truly wonderful endeavor just to have it pure as well, except you, in the technology end of things, you're then taking on already solved problem and you're trying to scale it. Uh, and development is a very challenging issue, but the chal issue, a challenge of a different kind than understanding how to develop it. And if you're in a step before, which is go ahead and give me the basics of why these things work, beautiful as well in so many ways, yet not really practical for truly making a difference in that encapsulation of just being pure science without it seeing a link to how to link to the technology. In many ways, I play right in that cusp of the two. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I do see the feedback across the technology of science being extremely important in order to advance. So are there problems that develop then when, as it sounds like the, the, the borders are so porous that um, it shouldn't matter as much if uh, which you think you're working in, but are there problems if you mistake the one for the other? I think the best thing to do is to have a buddy. Uh, have a buddy that, that you can trust and that understands the complementary part that you don't. Uh, I, I, at least in my own experience, have a fantastic time working with chemists. Uh, my very close friends are uh, Tim Swager and Munji Bawendi in the chemistry department, who both make chemicals that uh, then I can imagine how to use. I would not have a slightest chance of knowing how to even start making the chemicals that they make. But we do get a vial of either powder of polymer or molecules from Swagger, or we get a vial of little glowing quantum dots, and we go ahead and now say, okay, there's this nanomaterial, it's magical, they made it, you know. What is it? You do optical characterization, and you go ahead and check out where the light is get, gets absorbed, what kind of light gets emitted. 
then you start saying, well, what can I do with this? That really makes a difference. So you work with Tim Swagger and you say, well, you tell me that this polymer is extremely sensitive to chemicals like TNT, dynamite. Great. You know, I know how to f actually make a really good solid state thing you can hold in your hand, chemical detector. Uh, as a matter of fact, you told me a way to start it, make a tin film, go ahead and expose it to TNT and it's going to stop glowing. And the stopping of the glowing is because of the chemistry that Tim Swagger does in it. And then I start thinking about, well, you know, there's a phenomena in optics known as lasing. If I can go ahead and use that very same glowing material and make a laser out of it, a laser is an amplifier of optical events, and you tell me your film is going to slowly stop glowing in presence of TNT, maybe I can amplify it if I make that film into an optically pumped laser. And in, indeed you can, we found out. And this way you can actually increase the sensitivity, detection of that dimming of the glow thousandfold uh, so that you can actually make thousandfold more sensitive detector even more sensitive than dog's nose in sniffing which is our best detector there is in sniffing out the, the, the uh, actual explosives for example now the reason why I specified just cited as one of the many many examples is that interplay between his materials that we have no idea how to make something that's chemically sensitive but I do know how to manipulate electrons and photons and think about stimulated events that utilize concepts in physics and concepts in conventional optoelectronics to then you connect to this nanoscale of material space and then make at the end a product or an item that has never been seen before or has never been quite performing to the level. So th this seems like a perfect example of the kind of interdisciplinary work that uh, goes on at MIT it seems more than other places and seems uh, increasingly vital in the 21st century as different fields kind of converge on one another. So I'm wondering, um, is, is, is my perception right that that's a hard thing to do at most places, and w what is it that makes MIT different? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I do emphasize to people uh, two things about MIT whenever I think about what really makes us truly different. And this is when I get the graduate student who's thinking about Stanford, Princeton, Caltech, or MIT. You know. And you say, well, I, at least I do. I, I all of those places are great, and all of those places can really give you good education. And in many ways, your primary education, especially as a graduate student, is very much linked to your research group. So all of these places, great research groups, you'll do great. One difference at MIT is that we're all connected via corridors. Uh, and that is, uh, seems like a small thing, but there is another element to that. And that is that you know, all our buildings were built in about the same time. So in some respects, they all look equally drabby or equally good. Uh, you never have a sense that you left your own environment. You start in my office, you can walk down the corridor and take a left, go down, take a right. You are now in the chemistry wing, looks just about the same. There's no uh, psychological barrier to opening a door and feeling like you're in someone else's turf. You indeed are with yet another colleague who happens to have an interesting thing to tell you. And his door is open. That's the second thing that really matters. Hence, it's very easy to knock and say hello and introduce. And I've never found uh, a, a, a lack of ability to develop a relationship in MIT. I always found that if I asked <coughs> and suggested, there was always a reciprocal response from the other faculty member. This is a very open campus, very, very open in both the way we interact with our students and interact with other faculty members. Everyone goes by first name. We don't, you know, there's not, there's not professor this or that. It's, I go by Vladimir with my students and they clearly uh, expect me to re reciprocate by calling them by their, their first names. That, I think, s puts a level of collegiality and level playing field where I can't rest on my laurels. Um, there are plenty of brilliant people on this campus, but you wouldn't know it by looking at their office that they're any more special than anyone else just down the hall. And they wouldn't act as if they're any more special either. They will actually just engage you in a conventional conversation tell you all that you would like to know as long as you reciprocate in the same way. Now, I, I don't think I've ever been in an institution with more open door, literally open doors than MIT. You can just walk into any building at any time. And I too have sensed this um, lack of hierarchy and uh, pure interest in the content. People are more interested in the content, it seems, than, than position. I also found that if I look at presentations of um, people who, let's say, want to represent the center, uh, there's a true joy uh, in a director presenting their colleagues' work. It is not as if people are uh, necessarily favoring their own little research and saying, 
this is the best thing to do. I find myself, at least, as I'm presenting, I, as I run these different centers, I, I find it just joyful to be allowed to present my colleagues' work, which is just brilliant, right, in so many ways. And emphasizing the brilliance of it uh, makes me feel proud to be able to have a chance to actually share it. So I, I, I guess the other thing that really distinguishes us is that we truly do take true pleasure in our colleagues' achievements. And that, I think, at the end, you know, breeds the collegiality that's truly unsurpassed. Um, related to that, just uh, what would, I think you may have just answered this, but what is your chief pleasure then in teaching? Uh, well, um, there are two products that we make uh, as, as an institute, as a university, um, only two. Uh, uh, one is knowledge, uh, new ideas, new patents, new papers, uh, and the other one is people uh, who are capable to take those ideas and actually push them forward or generate new ideas thanks to the fact that we managed to show them how to get to the first one. Uh, so my joy is when I see an aha moment, when I say something in a classroom and a student in back says, oh, that's what you meant. And you know, yeah, that's what I meant. You know, it's a small thing and, and it's not like it's going to change your life tomorrow. But, you know, that moment, your life just got a little broader and you got kind of like a picture of where I was heading. And a few times you get the questions from the students. They also say, well, I, you know, I can't answer that because I never told to it that way. But you know what? I'll come back tomorrow because that's a really good thing to ponder. And you come back tomorrow and you kind of try to describe and you say, well, you know, I thought of it and it's just this, or maybe I, th I thought of it. And, you know, that's a really good line of research to pursue. You know, sure, let's, let's, let's think about that more. So uh, m my joy is in re recognizing for undergrads, it's recognizing those aha moments. With graduate students, with graduate students is, uh, you know, typical graduate student in my group stays for about five years. And I like to emphasize that with them as I start, um, that first two years, more likely than not, I'll be saying a lot of stuff and I'll be telling them a whole bunch of things. And the latter three years, two and a half, is their job to teach me. Because at that point, they are nearly nearing being the world expert in what they're doing. By the five years mark, they are the world expert. I mean, that's their goal. They should be in that little discipline, little subfield of a little subfield. They should be the best in the world doing that. And hence, I cannot match their understanding of what it truly is. But I'll revel in uh, being able to talk to them about it because, I mean, how often do you get the chance to be next to world experts in things that I care about because, indeed, we grew it together. So uh, that's, I mean, my joy is in seeing that. Now, the next step beyond that, if my students are able to get jobs um, and actually make a difference in the world, I revel in that as well. I mean, the, uh, in many ways, what I value uh, again is that ex exportation of knowledge and people who are capable to take that knowledge to fruition of some sorts. And it can mean either generating that little idea we had or generating jobs uh, that are carrying out the, the little idea, starting little companies that can actually uh, make a difference to someone. Or, you know, if we have a big idea, you know, saving the energy uh, footprint of this or that village uh, by introduction of this or that technology. I mean, there are many ways to take joy out of it, right? Um, but it's all about advancement. It's all about advancement of people and knowledge. Yeah, and you mentioned the uh, spin-off companies that I know you've been involved with a lot. I know you've got a million different things going on. So what, what, what's the um, process that leads to a student or a grad student spinning a startup company out of your lab? And <laughs> how do you participate in that? Well, we need to have a good idea, right? I mean, so yeah, we do have a lot of patents that we filed within MIT. I have, I think at this point, I have maybe 50 issued patents by United States, uh, maybe more than that internationally, but it's all the same idea. Um, so patents are good because those allow you to have something to bargain with as you want to start a company. Uh, how does a student start a company? Well, let's start with a good idea. And we started, for example, Q Division was the first company we started from my group. Um, before that, um, I had the chance of participating in observing, being a graduate student who was assisting uh, others start companies. Uh, so my own graduate advisor, Steve Forrest at Princeton, um, uh, was very entre entrepreneurial, st is still very entrepreneurial. And one of the things that I was working on as a graduate student was organic light emitting devices. And I had the chance to see what it means to try to launch a technology. We started with no patents. You know, we had just a few demonstrations. 
it was a very hot and very interesting field to be in. A whole bunch of really neat science, but also nifty technologies, you know, solar um, LEDs that are transparent, that look just like a piece of glass. And indeed, Minority Report as a movie has used some of those ideas to kind of show really cool TV displays or displays you can flex th so they're as thin as a sheet of paper or, I mean, just variety of very simple gizmo-like things you can imagine. But underlying all of that is how do molecules get electrically excited? How do all these really cool things. So I realized that in that my own graduate research, I could go ahead and develop these ideas. We'll go ahead and patent it. We'll go ahead and then make a few gizmos. Then we'll go ahead and show it to some people that might care about it. We'll have to process a thought on you know how valuable is this for the world? Is this truly groundbreaking? Is this earth shattering in some way? Is this going to interest anyone? And even if it does interest someone, is the market big enough for anyone to actually care to invest in this? And is this something that can sustain one job or 50 jobs or 1,000 jobs? And after that little economic thinking on how far can you go, then you say, well, how can I raise the money? Well, I can go and try my best and get a few grants. And maybe in a year, I'll get another grant. And I'll have two guys run this thing. And eventually, that might blossom. Or I can go ahead and say, well, if this is such a great idea, and let's say the market is $100 billion in display technologies. Well, maybe I can go and ask for $10 million from a venture capitalist. And because he wants to get 100. If he gives me 10, he wants a tenfold in return of his money. So I can say, well, there's a 100 billion option. So come up with that technological landscape that indeed is rich enough to be able to support uh, initial fruit of the development that you have from your lab. With that, uh, come up with a really enthusiastic student. And this, this is not just technically savvy, but someone who has a vision to see where are the economic benefits uh, of this technology and be able to speak to it in a way that would enable others to see that vision. Because you have nothing in your hand except a little gizmo. And you're selling a, an ability to change the world. Well, the only way you can do that is if you have the power of persuasion in your words and in your ability to paint a picture for people where this can go and provide a technical roadmap that spells out step by step what needs to be done. So often what we do, uh, if a student would like to start a company, First thing to do is to recognize there's a, we need a team. We need a technical lead, maybe the student. We need a, a technological development team, uh, which is maybe, again, this one student. Um, and uh, then have a faculty member like myself, have a, a good advisor from Sloan School or from the Angel uh, commun community around Boston. Put a package like that to four or five people, walk into an office of VC, present it. Uh, but present it in a way that will tell you that in five years you'll get somewhere. And uh, often, it ends up with a concrete job for the students. And it will never be any better than that, because they are the most enthusi enthusiastic people to fly this technology. They're the ones who invented it in the lab. They're the ones who saw it from the seed growing into a, a sapling, growing into a true thing that can actually change the world. So you have all you need. You have enthusiasm brilliance of students, and you have the financial support from the back. My job then just becomes to stand on the side, observe, and once in a while give a suggestion that might help out a tad more. But really, it, at that point, it goes into students' hands that are now PhD doctors uh, that know what they're doing. So again, it's this uh, emerging theme of integration where the idea is just one piece of it. Communication is as important, yeah? Very much so. Well, you, 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 I want to go back to the um, QD vision yes. idea, which, as I understand it, is a much more efficient light bulb, basically. Yeah. yeah. And you're, it works with something called quantum dots. Yes, so invented by my colleague, uh, Professor Munjiba Wendy, in chemistry. So what are qu quantum dots, and how, in layman's terms, how do you make a light out of dots? <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, if you ever drank Gatorade, you might have found once in a while under sunlight, it kind of appears to be e e um, glowing almost, right? And it actually is. Uh, you know, there are, and what's glowing inside that is molecules, uh, little items that we call molecules. And we're not scared of molecules. We think, well, molecules, that, that's usual stuff. Well, well, they're one nanometer in size. I mean, you know, those are nano items that, that you know, you optically or electrically excite them and they glow. 
so many nano items are surrounding us everywhere. You know, car paints. Car paints are also made of nano items. That's use of nanotechnology. Uh, that happens to be molecules. They happen to be coloring our cars. You know, pigments on the inkjet paper, inkjet printed paper. Uh, another example. Again, one nanometer size elements, and we don't even think of it as one nanometer size elements. We think of it as a print, right? Uh, stained glass windows. Those are nano balls of metal inside pieces of glass. And in that case, they happen to have a particular color absorption and reflection property that allows you to make a stained glass. So these are all you know, little nano items. So among them are possibilities to take a chunk of stone. And uh, stone, in this case, would be indium phosphide, um, cadmium selenide, uh, zinc sulfide. These are crystals that come as big little chunks of stone. And now, now take a chisel and chisel out just the tiniest little stone. Now, we don't really chisel anything out, but uh, imagine doing that. And now you have a little chunk of stone that is uh, 30 atoms across, let's say. So that little item is so small. It's 30 atoms. So you say, well, it's, if I'm an electron, it might seem like a big enough box for me to roam. It is, but you know, even electrons like more than just 30 atoms to roam across. And it turns out that I can, I can't, but my colleague Mujiba Wendy can, he can choose the size of a box he makes. He can make these little chunks of stone using uh, chemicals. He mixes up chemical A and chemical B. One contains, let's say, cadmium. Another one contains selenium atoms. You stick them in a pot of hot oil. Cadmium falls off. Selenium falls off. They swim in this hot pot of hot, uh, hot oil. Cadmium meets selenium. They bond. They form a little, tiny little crystal. And you keep on cooking this, and more cadmium adds in, and more selenium adds in. And now I'm going to cool it down, and what I'm going to be left with is a solution with a whole bunch of little crystals. If I cooked the solution for a long time, the crystals will be big. If I cooked the solution for a short time, they would only manage to be very small ones. So what can I do with those? Well, they're just of the size that electrons can be inside them, clearly, because everything is made of atoms that have electrons in them. But the size of the box is a little bit too small. And this is manifested in the following way. It's manifested by giving you small crystals They'll be blue in both their absorption and their glowing luminescence. Big crystals, they'll be red in both their absorption and luminescence. And the crystals in between, they'll be the colors that are in between those. So if you're a little bit bigger than blue crystal, you'll be green. A little bit bigger than the green crystal, you'll glow yellow, orange, red. As you change the size from, let's say, 3 nanometer crystals, 10 atoms across, to uh, 9 nanometer crystal, 30 atoms across. So that's the brilliance and simplicity of it, where I can, you can ask next is, you know, how come different size crystals have different color? I just told you they do, but how come? Well, there's one thing that is true that we never tell people, and that is that electrons really are waves. You know, we think of electrons as particles, but they're really waves. Uh, just the same way as the photons are both waves and particles. The two are, happen to be exactly the same in many ways. And so if electron is a wave, it needs to resonate. It needs to bounce back and forth off the walls of this particle. Give me the small particle, and the wave of the electron will be very, very short, which means its energy will be high. If I make the electron that has, sits in a bigger box, its wavelength will be longer, which means its energy would be less. And this leads to the higher energy, small particles, bigger energy, larger particles, Another analogy that Muji Bowendi would say, he say, you know, when you play a uh, violin and you pluck a string and you hear a sound. Now go ahead and press down the string and make the, the uh, length of the string a little shorter. Pluck it now. You'll hear a higher note. Same thing. Give me a smaller box. You'll, you'll pluck the note and you find that the color of light coming out is bluer. So we're going to have sheets that uh, can project any color, like a television, like a huge. So yes. So now take these little quantum dots mm -hmm. and ink them over a surface. Mm -hmm. And ink this area here blue, and this area green, and this area red. These areas will be contain many, many quantum dots, because areas are maybe only 20 microns across. 20 microns is like one-fifth of the thickness of your hair. But those 20 microns will contain thousands of dots. So ink an area with uh, some green, some blue, and some red. 
and you can optically excite them to get, again, colors coming back at your eye, or you can maybe put electrodes on top and the bottom of these sheets of quantum dots and electrically excite them. And when you electrically excite them, they'll glow. And a good example of that I like to emphasize or point out is a pickle. So a pickled cucumber pickle, uh, if you go ahead and put two electrodes in a pickle and you apply enough voltage, like 110 volts, you'll start observing yellow glow coming out of it because you're exciting sodium atoms inside the pickle. Sodium is from sodium chloride, from the pickling of the pickle. Sodium is about a nanometer in size or less. Uh, and uh, so here's nano item glowing, electrically excited by the electrodes. Same thing here, except rather than needing 110 volts, we slice the pickle really, really thin. And so to generate same kind of fields, you only need about 5 volts or 3 volts to excite the very thin layer of dots that you can say is thus akin to a sodium inside the pickle. So is the idea then that the dots can be used in any, any place you need illumination, from a regular light bulb to a television screen to uh, uh, the screen over Times Square? In many ways, yes. Uh, I mean, the quantum dots themselves are the ultimate, in many ways, light source, as long as optically or electrically excited. But the beauty of them is they can tailor for you the spectrum of light that you'll see. They'll, tail they'll give you warm light or cold light, all by choosing a different amount of mixtures of the red, greens, or blues. And, and, and when can I buy this at Home Depot? <laughs> so today you can buy light bulbs, um, but these are light bulbs that are optically excited. So essentially what you can do today, uh, you can go ahead and uh, look at the most efficient lighting that's available, which is LED lighting that starts with a blue light that excites a yellow phosphor. And that's what's right now available at Home Depot, blue light with yellow phosphor. And combined, your eye thinks it's looking at white. However, it's a very cold white. It's missing the red hues. And so what we've done, uh, actually what Q Division has done, uh, inspired by work done at MIT, is uh, to take the red quantum dots, add it to this blue-yellow light bulb, and take away some of those blue extra photons, excite the red quantum dots, all combined. Now you have a little bit less blue. You still have the yellow from the phosphor from before. And now added to that is this beautiful red extra peak giving you an overall spectrum that looks very much like an incandescent light bulb, but uses only about one-fifth, one-sixth of the energy. So dramatic energy savings at the same quality of light. And as the LEDs keep going down and down and down in cost, uh, give it a couple of years. And it's going to economically seem a no-brainer to invest in LEDs as opposed to even fluorescent light bulbs that happen to be issues with mercury disposal packaging and so forth. Um, while we're on the uh, spin-off company area and the, yeah. and the, and the, and the tough science, um, your one other spin-off company you have, Kativa, yes. I have read, focuses on the development of uh, printed organic electronics. That's right. Now to this, to me this sounds like a, a, an all-cotton iPod. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, 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 I don't know how you knew that. Yeah. <laughs> so That's exactly it. So I, I'm guessing it's not that, but I was wondering if you could explain to me what it is. Sure, it's an all-cotton uh, Well, you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, uh, I mean for my graduate work, I worked on organic LEDs, right, as, as, as I mentioned earlier. And, and all those are, are um, Again, those electrified pickles slice really thin. In this case, though, you use organic molecules to give you the glow. I, I, I mentioned before, they are, again, that nanometer scale items that can be optical or electrically excited. Mm. Um, the uh, organic LEDs make beautiful displays. And uh, there are demonstrations. Companies like Sony, Samsung, LG have demonstrated 11, 15, 17 inch displays. The only little problem with them is that they cost maybe 10 times more than conventional screens. As a matter of fact, you look at the screen and you say, this is so simple. How can it cost so much? I mean, the uh, only thing you have is a piece of glass, some electrodes, a little bit of electronics, and then just this film of molecules in the top electrode, and you're done. Um, it should cost a lot less than a liquid crystal display, which is a standard today, which has on top of everything uh, polarizers, liquid crystal that's liquid, uh, these um, rotating plates. I mean, just a whole bunch of color, just a whole bunch of things. Um, yet. It's cheaper still today to make liquid crystal displays because the technology has been around for about 20 years in commercial use for really good ones. OLEDs, organic LEDs, invented about 20, 25 years ago, but commercially really available only for a few years. Um, 
And so you look at the big Achilles heel of that technology and it's patterning, being able to actually give mm -hmm. a very well-defined pattern of particular molecules with a well-defined thickness uh, over extremely large areas. And the reason for it is that, you know, in my OLED, my whole OLED, the entire device, consists only of 100 molecules in thickness. So take a device, take a, and kind of get your sense, it's 0.1 microns, uh, which is one one thousand of a thickness of your hair, roughly. So take your hair, slice it a thousand times lengthwise. That's the thickness of the whole OLED screen. So you can, you know, put it on anything. You want it. But out of those 100 molecules, it's the middle 10 molecules that are glowing. So if I'm going to give you a technology that's going to make TV displa displays made of OLEDs, I'm going to give you a technology that's able to put down accurately with a 10 molecule accuracy films of molecules over very large areas. That's a big challenge in the organic LED manufacturing industry. Uh, and then on top of that, I would like to have molecules that glow red over here, 20 microns away, I would like to have molecules that glow green, and then 20 microns away, the blue ones, and then repeat that over and over again. And you know what else? I do not want any of my pixels that make my TV screen to look bad. I want all of them to work exactly right. As a matter of fact, all the 3 million pixels and subpixels, every single one better be absolutely perfect for me to buy your display. That's a very tall order, because if I'm going to give you a, any electronic technology, I'm going to give you an a Intel Pentium chip, right? There are plenty of really bad transistors in that Pentium chip, but there are redundant circuits that make sure that in a case there is a misdoing of one of the transistors inside that billion element chip, there are other circuits that pick up the slack and work, compensate for the error. Or you can give me a solar cell. You know, you look at a solar cell, you know, light gets absorbed. You don't know that sections of that solar cell don't work very well. But stuff you stare at, displays, you are looking at every element I made, right? And so what Kativa has, um, he has likely a solution to this really challenging problem on how to print organic electronics in general, specifically thin films for organic displays over very large areas uh, as needed. Uh, you can think of it almost like making a saddle plotter for, in this case, not just posters, but for electronics. Uh, I'm sorry, a saddle poster? Sa saddle pl plotter. So saddle like plotter. like if you, if you look at inkjet printers, mm -hmm. uh, they print uh, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, right? But whenever we make posters, we go to this thing that's called saddle plotter. And what it is, it's, it's an inkjet printer that's this wide and this narrow, so it looks like a saddle. And you, sheet, you feed a very large sheet of paper through it, and you print the whole poster that's now two by four feet or six by 10 feet, however big you want to make it. Uh, so inkjet printing over that large areas is now doable. So we're thinking that's just optics. Can I give you an inkjet printer that prints electronics? And so the tools that Kativa is making are indeed very large. They can handle uh, two meter by two meter pieces of glass, if you want, which is you know as tall as me and as wide as me, right? So the, uh, in that sense, it can generate an ability to deploy electronics on nearly any surface in a format that you might be desirable by simply you know on the fly programming it how you want to make it. So, so that would that would radically drive down the cost of of LED s television screens. Yeah. Absolutely. They'd, but be, they'd be every, will we, will we have that Minority Report future where screens are everywhere on my practice table? A Minority Report future is, is today. We have stuff like that in the lab. We actually, uh, when minority, before Minority Report was filmed, we had the transparent and flexible displays. And then at one day, uh, I was uh, visiting UD UDC, Universal Display Corporation, a company got started uh, based on our organic LED research back when I was a graduate student. Uh, and uh, we heard that a crew from next Tom Cruise movie was coming to talk to us. So they did. I do not know which movie it is. The next thing I knew that next year, Minority Report came out and they had uh, ideas that were very similar to what we were talking about back in the late 90s, which was transparent displays and flexible displays and light emitting surfaces. Uh, so it's nifty. <laughs> it is nifty. Um, I, you know, I as we're talking, I'm thinking about um, a statement you made that life, we live our lives at the nano scale. And I, I, I get a little of what you mean, but I'm a little confused. When I get up in the morning and I drink my cup of coffee, I'm, 
I'm living at the 12 ounce scale, at the eight ounce <laughs> scale. I think, aren't well, I? Well, well, I, I, it's 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 a fantastic question. I mean, I think we are uh, uh, creatures who consume macro quantities of nanoscale. It is uh, indeed uh, op the way that the water dresses the insides of your body, but those water molecules, the way they interact with the insides of your body, that makes a difference for the way the way our neurons fire, or makes a difference for the way that our uh, you know digestive system works. Uh, it is leaching of ions from our bones into our system that controls the firing of our neurons. And I know very little about biology, but I do appreciate the fact that um, it's the ion channels, right, that make a difference. And all that ion channels do is that let sodium or, or potassium go in and out, uh, and that change causes a change in potential. That little change in potential causes our neurons to spaz. And that spazzing with the neurons sends a signal, an elect electrical signal, to our brain. And our brain says, whenever that particular neuron is spazzing, I must be looking at green light at that section of my eye. And then, you know, these million uh, signals come to the eye, and then we see an image, right? Uh, because those signals were then translated to spazzing, and then ends up. So at the end, I need to ask you, you know, what happens when that single photon hits that single molecule inside my eye? and opens up that ion channel that's made of, oh, not single molecule, but maybe four molecules, right? Mm -hmm. But is that nanoscale that at the end it will govern the way that I will respond? And yes, I am experiencing macroscopic nanoscale response all at once. And yes, it's incredible, right, that our brain is able to go ahead and manage all this input um, all at once. Like, you know, it, I marvel at the fact that I can ignore the fact that my jacket and my shirt are touching my body, right, as I'm speaking to you, right? Because, uh, but it's happening, right, all the time. I'm able, I'm, I'm sensing all those things, except my brain knows to just focus on this one thing, looking at you and talking to you, mm -hmm. uh, and not uh, tune out all the other parts. I mean, what? So we always deal with macroscopic amount of information, but at the end, the way it's translated to us is via nanoscopic type event. Uh, and appreciation of the nanoscopic type event will allow me to understand how to modify, how to make it look different, how to make it uh, appear different. So do you have moments when you're walking down the street that the world li is like seeing the matrix? You suddenly see <laughs> things in, <laughs> in nano form? No. Or imagine, uh, <laughs> it, or, ima or imagine it to be shown? Would you like to? Well, you know, I, 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 I guess the only thing I've ever done uh, is try to understand the world around me. And, you know, I, I realize, uh, so I teach a class. Uh, uh, 6007. Yeah, it's uh, uh, electromagnetic energy from motors to lasers. And uh, it was a fantastic learning experience. A colleague of mine, Rajiv Ram, uh, co-developed it with me. And Rajiv taught me an amazing amount of stuff in the process. But the challenge to us was to try to relate to a student in the course of a semester everything that we might uh, experience in a process of living our life. Now, both of us are electrical engineers. And we wanted to essentially give you applied electromagnetics, but not by telling you Maxwell's equations and by telling you this is how you go about solving the cylindrical coordinates. And this is, I, I, that's not real. I mean, it's real, but it's not real from perspective of actually seeing an, iP uh, an iPhone and saying, you know, everything in this iPhone is electrical engineering, every, every single bit of it, right? I mean, I'm going to show you how the antennas work. I'll show you how the display works. I'll show you how the microphone is made. I'll show you how the accelerometer works. Figure out how the picture twists around when you turn the phone around. I'll show you how to uh, make a battery. I'll go ahead and then connect it to the whole system and tell you how the two communicate. I mean, that's that's what matters at the end, right? And and so your Wii controller now that you 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 swing around to play your game, you realize that oh, oh that has an accelerometer, and all that the darn accelerometer is. It's just a little little piece of silicon that has a little spring on it that happens to move left and right and change the capacitance between the left contact and the right contact as it swung back and forth, which is interpreted as me moving my hand. Or when you go ahead and, uh, you know, we spend a lot, I mean, we spend time talking about, again, everything from motors to lasers. So there is, you know, launching of magnets. There is uh, liquid crystal displays. There is tunneling in uh, touch skins, there is. I mean, so I find that as you ex uh, tell the story of the class, and the class is taught in 50 stories. I mean, we have 50 lectures that, and it's fairly rigorous. At the end, you understand both electricity and magnetism, 
electrostatics, electrodynamics, and quantum mechanics all in the same look. Um, but at the end of that, uh, you realize that, you know, I, I needed to spend a class talking about how we see, the fact that if I'm going to trick you into seeing yellow, you know, there's no yellow pixel on my TV display. So how come my TV can make a yellow image? Well, there is a way that our brain works, so you have to explain that. Or, you know, how do I make a 3D image when I go to that movie theater? Oh, well, all you need is a polarization rotator, a quarter wave plate, a polarizer, and uh, go ahead and do a different polarization for left and right circularly polarized light for the left and right eye. And so that sounds really complicated, but at the end, all it is is I'm saying I'm sending a different image to a left eye and a right eye. My brain sees those at the same time and interprets the three-dimensional image. And here are seven ways, to, or let's say four different ways you can do it based on the tools we just learned last class. And while you're at it, you might as well make a hologram. You know? So you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a big deal uh, if you start in very small steps and recognize that it is that nanoscale, right, again, in my head. Like it's that, w it's that, that is what you need to know. I, I'm starting to see the romance of it now. And to <laughs> me, it, it is like seeing the, the, the matrix. It's like seeing what's really going on at the most basic level in reality. So I'm wondering when that moment happened for you. Like, what was the moment that you fell in love with the nano world? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so. I'm not sure I ever, had a, I ever had a definition of it being a nano world until I needed to express it as a professor. You know, what do I do? And I realized sometime in as I joined MIT in 2000, that I need to say, what do I do? And I think I do nanostructure materials. I imagine uses of nanostructure materials in optics and electronics. But, and as, uh, but as a boy, I mean, there, there must have been uh, a time before you had realized this is what well, the world but, was. Well, but it has always been, you know, why does it work, right? And it's, you know, it's why does a flashlight work? Or it's been, you know, how come the radio works? That's really what got me excited uh, from the, in the in as, a, as a boy. And, you know, as I moved to the United States, I recognized I can actually spend time thinking about the details or what happens on the nanoscale, that's, that was remarkable to me. I spent, um, I think, one of the first experience, the eye-opening experiences was, uh, as an undergraduate, I helped put together one of the first atomic f uh, uh, scanning tunneling microscopes that we had at Princeton. Um, and uh, a colleague, uh, well, a professor, uh, Antoine Kahn, who I worked as an undergrad in, in his lab, he uh, let me participate, and just let me you know, help out. and and. What it was, I mean, what scanning tunneling microscope is, is a really sharp needle that you can bring uh, in uh, in vicinity of a surface and image individual atoms with this very sharp needle. So scanning? Tunneling microscope. Scanning and tunneling at the same time. Okay. Yes, so scanning. the scanning simply means you're rastering the needle across the surface. Mm -hmm. Tunneling is this really cool thing with cover in 6007, which is uh, electrons can jump through air from one surface to another if the gap between the two surfaces is very, very small. Mm -hmm. And uh, the jumping through the air allows you to, so if I put some positive voltage on the, on the tip that's scanning and negative voltage on my surface, I can have electrons jump from the surface to the tip uh, as they like to go to the more positive end. And I can observe when is it that I see current. If I, my tip is very close to the surface, I will see the current. If my tip is far away from the surface, I will not see the current of electrons jumping because the gap is too big. So what I can do is I can, if I can control the motion of my tip, I can tell you exactly how the texture of the surface looks when it has the bumps and when it has the valleys. And if I can do that, and I can do it with enough accuracy, what's been shown in the 1980s is that you can do it with the accuracy of seeing individual atoms. So to me, that was mind-blowing. You, know, you can actually see individual atoms. You know, before that, it was all hypothetical. And now the mystery becomes like, well, what happens when I put another atom on top of these atoms? What's going to? Mm. So the moment, I mean, it's easy to get hooked, right? I mean, if you can recognize that it is not mysterious, it is not something far out there. It's right here in front of you. And you can press a button or move a needle and actually see another atom. I mean, <laughs> that's, that, that's, it becomes real. And before that, it was just a picture in some, in some textbook. Um, you mentioned coming to America. Where were you born? In uh, I was born in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, uh, now Serbia. Uh, so this was, uh, I, I got here in uh, 1984, uh, and I finished high school in the United States, and then uh, started college and graduate and you, school. You, you were involved with Princeton and Columbia both, yeah? I was, I was at Princeton as an undergraduate. I went to Columbia, uh, stayed for a couple of years, and got my master's degree. Uh, and then decided to come back to Princeton to uh, complete my PhD degree. 
and uh, and every one of those places I had a, you know one of those you know rem every experience is a, a set of chances and circumstances right and mm -hmm. in a similar fashion you know my own journey was very much the luck of being surrounded by brilliant people and being surrounded by uh, tremendous opportunities and recognizing that I can go ahead and try out some stuff. When you came, I mean, those are both um, New York C City central areas. Was it um, difficult to leave the center of the universe when you came here <laughs> to Boston? You know, no, no, no. Uh, actually, I, uh, New York is a very, very, very busy place. Uh, and I it's uh, uh, when I moved in uh, into my Columbia housing, I mean, you, you deal with little bugs and cockroaches and stuff. That's okay. You know, that's, that's all right. But the... Uh, it's a very lonely city, right? Because uh, unless you have a circle of friends, right, and uh, to actually go to, so I found myself uh, very much again focused on my laboratory and finding the community of people around there. Uh, New York can be very distracting, right? It can pull you in very many, many different directions, but that is not necessarily the best thing to do as you're thinking about mm -hmm. about the world. And and you know, I, I get plenty of inspiration just talking to my students in my lab. You know, I don't. I don't find myself needing to stimulate myself, but yet by yet another amazing experience in New York. You do those on, you know, whenever you want to go to an opera or you want to go to a play, but you know, that's once in a while. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't need to live in a city for that. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. So how, how about your kids? Are they into science? And uh, do you want them to be? Are you? Oh, I, my kids can, uh, I, I don't want to influence the, the way uh, they eventually turn out. I want to make sure I give them all the chances that they choose to take. Uh, so. And how many children do you have? I have four. Four, and what are their ages? Well, my youngest is six. I have a six, eight, ten, and twelve. Easy to remember. Uh, I start with a girl, then there's a boy, girl, and a boy. So we have a, a, a bit of everything, which is wonderful. It's just wonderful to see the dynamic between them uh, as friends, as colleagues, as people who teach each other. Mm -hmm. uh, this morning I was, uh, uh, well, I, you know, I, I get excited about math and, and science in general, just like applied math. So this morning I was in my um, uh, elementary school that my kids go to. Uh, I do it on Wednesdays. I go in the third grade because I have a third grader. I have a fifth grader. So Wednesday I was, for example, teaching. And, and what I do is I show up. I have a little PowerPoint presentation. And the PowerPoint presentation can be about anything. So we did calendars. Uh, and we learned that if you take uh, the 4th of April, the 6th of June, the 8th of August, the 10th of October, and the 12th of December, so 4, 4, 6, 6, 8, 8, 10, 10, and 12, 12 in a calendar, all those happen to be Monday in 2011. Add to that 9, 5, 5, 9, 7, 11, 11, 7. All those also happen to be Mondays. And the 0th of March, the last day of February. So now you can ask me any day of the year, and I can tell you what day, what day of the week was that particular day of the year, because I have a crutch yeah. for, for every one of the... And then and you can interpolate between... And you can't. And you know what? Th these are third graders. And the whole point of showing them that is to then ask them to do addition, right? To ask them to tell me, you know, since the 12th of December is a Monday, well, what's the 19th of December? Hmm. Oh, it's a Monday, too. Well, how do you do that? Right. Or to ask them, you know, April has 30 days, and what if it rained? What, what, what if it rained for two inches of rain every one of those days? Right. Know, how many how much rain would it be mm -hmm. or what if if you slept for eight hours every every day how many days in April did you sleep I mean it's all about very simple things but it tells them that they can actually use the math in very practical ways so the reason why I'm telling you that story is that after my 10 minutes of doing a little PowerPoint and it has to be a penguin or a piece of cheese or an exploding <laughs> pumpkin you know there has to be something to draw them into the, the story uh, you give them little worksheets, and again, my wife does a brilliant job in putting together these uh, stories about fairies or knights or pirates that that are all based on the theme we just covered. You know, pirate wants to find the treasure, but he can only find it on Tuesdays of this week. Um, that being said, uh, we ask, you know, well, let's do the worksheets, and then I can, by looking at my fifth grader who sits next to my third grader, and he goes ahead and asks her questions so she can he, so she can answer it as he tries to, to, to tutor her through it. Now, that's a joy. Like, uh, that, like seeing that happen, seeing that exchange, recognizing they actually care about these few little things I tell them. It can be anything, right? It doesn't have to be math. It doesn't have to be science. I just want them to be, to be passionate about the next thing they do. And they're beautiful artists. I mean, they draw beautiful pictures. And if that's what they want to do, that's what they should do. They're 
awesome in writing stuff. Again, that's what excites me about my kids. <laughs> so how often do you, do you teach at the elementary school? Well, um, I go about every week. Uh, so every uh, Wednesday morning is the third grade this year, and uh, every Friday morning is the fifth grade. So is it? How, have you had days where you've 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 gone from third graders to fifth graders to yeah. <laughs> up the scale? Well, y yes, uh, I, I do remember uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago, I started with a fourth grade math morning, uh, followed by uh, probably an undergraduate class, followed by I think I gave a talk to the graduate students, and then uh, in the afternoon I was asked to give a talk to the MIT Corporation. So it was wonderful to start uh, by the inspirational talk to the very youngest and then end up recognizing that, you know, the most important talk of the whole day, yes, I enjoyed very much talking to corporation, but the most important talk of the whole day, I think, was that very first one where I was trying to do my very best mm -hmm. to inspire those fourth graders into saying, ah, science is really cool, or math is really cool, well, or the world around me can actually be quantified and measured in some way. Okay, so thinking about um, kids maybe is a good transition to thinking about the future. Yeah. And uh, so I have a few questions about the future, and I want to start with um, the future that used to be. So and my question is, look, it's almost 2012. Where is my solar-powered house? Oh, um, just wait a few more years. I mean, it's coming. It's coming. Mm -hmm. Really. Oh, really. <laughs> so <laughs> so we'll, co we'll come to the artificial leaf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so so uh, uh, it it is not it is not that far away actually uh, you know for the remarkable thing about solar technology in general is speaking it's it it has taken a remarkably fast path in being more and more affordable and we are still and by we because I'm a scientist that works or technologist that works in that area um, we are maybe still a factor of two or three away from being practically applicable and you can say well that maybe is a little too long well uh, it will take, I don't know, five, six years to reach cost parity with an average price of electricity. But you know, even today, it makes a lot of sense to install solar uh, if you're willing to wait for payback. Uh, and the best way to put it is that if you look at the cost of electricity in the United States, uh, in North Dakota, it's less than five cents a kilowatt hour if you happen to be an industry who's spending the electricity simply because all the coal fields are there, coal burning power plants are there, it's easy. If you are in Hawaii, it's 26 cents a kilowatt hour because you need to burn petroleum because there is no coal, there is no natural gas. Easiest thing to do is burn petroleum. Well, I would like to replace all of that with solar or wind or something renewable so I don't spoil the planet. Wonderful, but um, I can't because uh, I mentioned before, you know, it's going to take about 10, 11 years of deployment of solar if I can pave them as fast as roads, and I don't quite know how to do that yet, to reach 10% of the electricity needs of US. Well, if that's the case, I can say, well, all right, uh, can I go beyond 10 one day? Well, I can't without batteries. Uh, if I don't have a way to store the sun energy, I can't really go ahead and, and go beyond 10% because I'll destabilize the grid. I need electricity at night. And the only way I can get that is by burning either coal or natural gas today. Hydro, nuclear is an option as well, right? But coal and natural gas in the US is the primary source. So um, I need those batteries. And without those batteries, 10% really is my ceiling where I want to be. Good. So my goal is to replace 10% of US electricity with solar. I do not need to be at the cost level of North Dakota because there are places in US that are paying a lot more than that. And those are the places I should really aim for, California, right? some places in Northeast. Um, if I can be at about 14 cents a kilowatt hour, I can reach 10% of US electricity needs. And I can say, well, where can I, I you know, how can I make a solar cell that's 14 cents a kilowatt hour? And then you start getting into economics. And you start realizing very simple things, like, uh, well, you know, the guy who reads the meter uh, and gets me the bill, he needs about three cents of those 14 cents a kilowatt hour for distribution, right? All right, that leaves me 11, okay? I'm gonna make a really good solar cell though, so maybe I can make it. So out of 11 cents, uh, how much it will of it will be to the installer guy who actually needs to mount this on my roof or put it in the field and wire it? He actually needs about a little more than half of my 
remaining 11 cents. Oh, I'll, I'll give him six. So he gets six cents a kilowatt hour. I have five cents a kilowatt hour left for me to do my magic in the lab and build me my solar cell. How much does that per meter square or yard square, right? So per meter square, how much does that come out to? Uh, well, that depends because, you know, I don't have the money to really invest in it. So I need to borrow it from a banker. Oh, but the banker will lend me the money either at a 6% interest rate if I'm really good or more realistically, historically, it's 10% interest rate. Ooh. So five cents a kilowatt hour, 6% interest rate. How much money is that? About $100 to make a meter square solar cell. Hmm. How about if he lends it to me a little more realistically at 10% interest rate? 60 bucks, that's all I have. To make my solar cell, it's a meter square. How much is a piece of glass? I have only 60 bucks, it's my budget. 20 is a piece of glass. Oh, I need two pieces of glass. That's $40 just for two pieces of glass. I'm left with $20 to do all my magic. And you know what? I need to pay someone to do it. He'll take at least 10 for salary per meter squared. So I'm left with about $10 to make a meter squared of a nanostructured, large quality device. That's, that's that's really really hard. I mean that's that's nearly impossible. But we do manage. I mean there are companies that can do that today. First Solar can do it with cadmium telluride tin films, nanostructured, you know, goo of that gets put down. It's not scalable because there's not enough tellurium in the world to really meet the needs. So we need different technologies. Um, and so looking at these kinds of thinkings, uh, we realize well there. Uh, maybe that's not necessarily the right way to think about it. Maybe the thing, way to think about it is to say, um, if I look at what's most expensive in this whole business, it's installation, among other things. Installation costs a lot. Well, why does it cost so much to install something? Well, maybe because it's heavy. Maybe because you know it, someone needs to carry it and put it down. And indeed, actually, if I give you a two by four foot solar cell, it's good 40 pounds in weight. And labor laws say that anything installed repetitively shouldn't be heavier than 50 pounds. So I can't make them bigger than two by four feet. Because if I could, I would make a really big one, right? And just unroll it. Because huh. if I can do that, I can reduce installation. All I would need to do is just staple this thing to the roof, right? Whole job done. Prefabricated stuff like prefab homes cost half as much than homes built in a field. So this is one way to really cut the cost of solar down. All right, so I'll make it rollable. Well, uh, if I can do that, what kind of substrate would I use? What kind of surface would I put this on? Well, maybe paper, maybe maybe uh, silicone foils, maybe aluminum foils. Oh, that every one of these I just mentioned, plastics, they can't sustain high temperatures needed to make a good solar cell. So I can't do solar cells, oh, unless I can invent a new type of solar cell that can go on top of it. How about solar cell made of molecules? quantum dots, polymers. Uh, you can take raspberry juice and a little bit of titanium dioxide, the stuff from a, a, a suntan lotion. You can make a solar cell. Raspberry juice and suntan lotion. Yes, there, there's a website that I can refer you to. <laughs> so I should actually do this. It's, it's not, it's not a, you can take, you know, there are a variety of things like that. We, I'm making a class, uh, I should teach in the spring, called Nanomaker, that um, we tried it this semester with freshmen. I teach freshman seminar. Um, and uh, it worked great. Um, Katie Lowe, a po postdoc, uh, developed it together with, again, Rajiv Ram and another postdoc, Joe Summers. Um, and it's great because we use face paint to make LEDs, raspberry juice to make solar cells. But to come back to solar cells, you can imagine using a variety of very simple things, car paints. Uh, one of the first organic tin film solar cells was made using essentially a red car paint and a blue car paint. And you evaporate these molecules and you get large area coverage. And it's extremely cheap from that perspective. But more powerfully, it's a room temperature process. So you put it on any surface without ever having to use high temperature steps. So working with Karen Gleason from Chemical Engineering, she developed a way to use chemical vapor deposition to coat paper with con electrically conductive material. And what we do then is take that conductive paper, take it to my lab, evaporate my red car paint and blue car paint, evaporate the top electrode, and make a solar cell that's on paper. That's all it is. It's a little solar cell paper. Earlier this year, we've chosen the right kind of materials, again, molecules, that do not absorb any of the visible light. They only absorb infrared and UV light, but nothing in the visible. And we made solar cells out of those. 
Mm-hmm. And how do they look? They look like nothing. They are transparent. They, they, are, they look like pieces of glass. You I, I think I've seen this on, on the web, and this is a, a, a company you're thinking of rolling out, which is basically just a screen you put on the wind, a transparent sheet you put on the windshield. How, what's the progress of that? Is that uh, when can I buy that at Home Depot? I give it a few years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a, any idea made in the lab, and mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. demonstrated this first time in March this year, any idea made in the lab takes typically uh, three to five to ten years to commercialize. So. I'm so afraid of running out of time, and, yeah, and, yeah. and I want to bring it back to MIT, but before I do, um, all of these things, it, it makes me think about this idea that, uh, at least when I was young, they used to say, nine out of ten, ninety uh, percent of all the scientists that have ever lived are alive today, yeah, because of the scientific revolution and the explosion of population. And we have this huge explosion of technology that we're living through. And it seems like you know, there are two schools of thought. One is that all of these wonderful inventions are going to save us and bring forward a new age of humanity that that's much better than we have now. And one is that we're not going to get there because all the other things that we're inventing and using and despoiling are going to uh, send us to our doom. <laughs> and, I, and I wonder how you feel about the role of technology in, 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 in uh, and the struggle between um, scarcity and post-scarcity, the boom. They sometimes they call us the boomsters versus the doomsters. Ooh, uh, I like that. I haven't heard it that mm-hmm. way, but I like that. Um, well, uh, y- there uh, we, we could go back to, to not thinking about things. We can just sit down and, you know, go back to where we used to be. The, you know, invention of food supply improvements, you know, crops that bear more fruits was in some ways what saved the humanity and allowed us to grow to as big as we are now. Um, so like advanced business agriculture, fantastic, but that came from science. Um, I think it, anything that we do, uh, you can use or misuse. Uh, and at the end, what we need to do is recognize what are the true challenges. I think often, uh, even when you look at the world of solar and you say solar cells will save the planet from warming, I'll, I'll challenge that because uh, I'll say, you know, the desert, that desert reflects 40% of the incoming light just by itself. And maybe even 60% of the incoming light gets reflected off of the desert. I'm going to take the, uh, my solar cell and put it in it, and I'll absorb 90% of the incoming light. And 10% of that will be indeed electricity, but the other 80 will warm up the desert twice as much than it would have gotten warmed up if I just left it alone without putting solar cells in it. So, how do I, f- I mean, that sounds like solar cells would just doom the world to overheating. Yeah, uh, true, unless I put aluminum foil around my solar cells to compensate for the reflectivity and hence have simply highly reflective areas that will reflect that energy back and areas that will absorb the light that will be my solar cell, one option. Other option is deploy the solar cell over oceans. Oceans absorb, and I d- or use the dead zones of the ocean so you don't kill any fish. But <laughs> you can look at all the dead zones of the ocean. You can, you, you know, there, there are a lot of very simple things you can do that make a huge difference. Uh, mm-hmm. Secretary Chu of uh, DOE was suggesting, you know, one really big thing for us to do as a country would be to paint our roofs white. Absolutely. I mean, that's a, I, I put my students a very simple uh, question. I say, you know, is there anything we can do to save the planet, you know, from overheating? Well, we can. We can, we can take aluminum foil and make rafts and put them on the ocean surfaces, again, over the dead zones. And you can balance energy and energy out just simply that way. Oceans are 90% absorptive of in incoming light. Aluminum foil is 88% reflective. It's very simple, you know, cover enough. In 50 years, you can produce enough aluminum foil to cover enough of the ocean to balance the present misbalance of the energy in, energy out. As an example, right? I mean, there are very many different ways to uh, promote a technology, but but I feel like the doom versus boom, it's all about having the cognizance and awareness of what the big challenges are. And the best we can do as educators is point to students what the big challenges are. 
and they'll come up with solutions. As you've been talking about, you know, translating it into action is as is, 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 is hard as coming up with a technology, if not harder. Um, you do this at MIT, you have uh, an energy efficiency project, you have classes that, that basically change in some way the infrastructure at MIT almost every year, yeah? So how does that work with the administration? I mean, you've just got, <laughs> we've got a really microcosmic example of what change is like, and I can, Im I imagine, that would be difficult in any organization. Well, you know, I, I, I don't run MIT, but, but I, I, I had the privilege of um, being involved in whole bunches of ways with MIT changing itself, especially in the energy arena, um, starting with the energy initiative that um, I, I was one of the young faculty who was asked to participate in the Energy Research Council that formed what's now known as MIT. Um, but in that discussions, uh, one of the things we very quickly realized is that you know, uh, all university, every university teaches, every university offers classes, and you know, we are good, Stanford is good, so are you know, dozens of other really good universities, right? So mm -hmm. we can't distinguish ourselves that way uh, by saying that we're doing something special. We're just contributing to the common knowledge. In the same way, uh, you can say, we have really smart students, just like any other university does. So what is it we can do that can truly make a difference? And we came up with uh, what is now known as the walk the talk, uh, task force of the uh, MIT Energy Initiative, where uh, if we're going to actually tell our students what needs to be done, why not just let them do it? And the, again, the brilliance of our campus is that we don't have a particularly beautiful campus. I mean, there's some really pretty places. Killian Court is gorgeous. But most of the campus today is somewhat old, especially the buildings built in the 60s, 50s, 40s. It wouldn't hurt them much if we chose to install solar collectors, if we chose to install new LED lights, if we chose for students to evaluate the performance of campus and make suggestions of what can be done, use campus as your lab. And in that way, uh, try to improve it. Now, you can't let students run helter-skelter, so we have amazing facilities department here. Actually, facilities that for the first time that I've ever observed, you know, are, well, in many ways, I don't think many of us appreciate them because I walk in my office expecting my lights to turn on, my heat to be on, expecting that I have all the commodities that they provide and I just take for granted. So they, on the other hand, recognize that there is this humongous intellectual p um, capital we have on campus. And we have figured out a way to connect facilities with academics, allowing us to run uh, classes, essentially, uh, projects where students can go ahead and try out stuff, figure out that a chemical hood uh, in a chemistry lab, if you leave the sash open, the amount of energy that is sucked out, the warm, warm air from the lab that sucked up the chimney and that you need to replenish by warming up a cold air from the outside, that amount of energy, just single hood, is comparable, I think, to about two or is it four household energy uses in New England. So leave the sash down after you're done using your hood is the, is the message, right? And so uh, we went to, uh, I, I didn't go, my colleague Leon Glicksman led this with undergrads. Um, and they went to the chemistry department chair and pointed this out. The chemistry department chair with his brilliance said, we'll have a local competition. Uh, we'll measure the energy use of each hood and you know, the lab that uses the least energy because they leave their sashes down after they're done will get, I don't know, sandwiches or pizza for <laughs> whatever it is. But it saved a lot of energy in the process uh, and hence recognized that you know, action, local action, can make a lot of uh, uh, difference uh, or just simply local awareness of your actions can make a huge amount of difference. Um, on the turning this now a little to the social aspect of life at MIT, MIT can be a very intense place. We lost two undergrads this year to mm -hmm. suicide. Yeah. And I wonder how if you have any thoughts about why that is or how you combat this kind of um, high stakes game that the students sometimes find themselves playing where personal worth is wrapped up with academic achievement or I don't know what it is. I mean, you would know better I than I me. I th well, I th no, I think you voiced it quite well. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a psychologist, so to understand this. I, I mean, I have my own little notions of why the world is the way it is and, and it's extremely unfortunate whenever anyone dies, especially a young student. I. I think, you know, the world we live in, I think, uh, puts a great deal of pressure on students. And uh, maybe more and more what I see is that students come to MIT or see their education as what I like to say as a bing bingo sheet. You know, there is mm -hmm. a bunch of boxes that need to get checked off. So I need to have two sports, seven, eight, eight P classes. 
I need to have a debating team, and I need to uh, be a straight-A student. So check, 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 check. I do that. I'll move to the next stage, which will be called the graduate school. I'll be there for five years. I'll go check, 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 check. And then I'll be able to live a life and you have a good salary. And that's not what life is. I mean, life is, I mean, especially when you come here, when you get to a graduate experience, certainly, it's, uh, it's a sense of discovery. I mean, you need to find out what is it that you're good at and how can you really change the world. Uh, and grades don't matter, right? Do not matter in a graduate uh, experience. On the undergrad end, uh, the one thing that we do have, uh, both as a challenge and as a benefit, is that we have students that are all similar in some ways. I mean, they're all highly motivated, highly motivated to do stuff, to use their hands, to make things. Um, I like to cite, uh, I guess I, I have this little thinking, I'm thinking, you know, when I was an undergrad at Princeton, uh, my electrical engineering class was 20 students, right? And, and every year there will be another 20 that come in. So let's imagine that 1% of all the students that go to Princeton, MIT, Caltech, Harvard, these top tier schools as, as un understood, let's imagine 1% of them are just truly out of this world, you know, just true brilliant people like you've never seen before. Well, at Princeton, you'll see one of those guys every five years. And there'll be an oddity. There'll be someone that you haven't had a chance to really see, except maybe. They will not be the standard. MIT, Introductory class, chemistry, bio, physics, electrical engineering, has a few hundred students, three, four, five hundred students sometimes. In that class, there are three or four of those truly outstanding people. They set the norm for the rest of us. Mm. And as a consequence of it, well, I feel a little diminished, right? I mean, although I'm, I might be a very good student and I'm surrounded by peers who are really good students, all of us don't feel like we're living up to the potential we should be at, as opposed to simply recognizing that we are really good. We are here already. I mean, for goodness sake, you made it in, into MIT, and it's an amazingly good place to be at for a point of view of being once surrounded by the peers who are really smart. You can learn a lot from to the opportunities, especially hands-on research opportunities that truly are you know, second to none. Mm -hmm. And anything you do will be good enough uh, when it comes the time to leave this place will be good enough to get you, you know, to be really, really productive in the world outside. At the end, that is what matters, rather than comparison of, you know, I got the C here, or I got the B plus here, you know. That's, that's not going to change the world, your little B plus. What's going to change the world if you're missing, so that we can't have your contribution down the line when we really, really need you. So, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like that message, I, I I do mention it once in a while to my students, uh, just to emphasize that you know it's also you know it's also really good to fail once in a while, just to get the sense of what it means to yeah. not live up to the standard you aspire to. And many of the students here never failed, right? I mean, they lived; they're very, very, very good in what they do. And once they come over and recognize that they're just average compared to their peers, that's a fairly unsettling experience, right? So. I do not know how to teach people how to fail, <laughs> but but maybe it's a thing we need to emphasize more mm -hmm. uh, and encourage. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe since it's pass fail the first semester, maybe we should encourage them to try to fail one class and see <laughs> see how it feels. I mean, it's I good know. That be your job. <laughs> try to fail. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Yeah. So maybe that's the answer. I was going to ask you if there's one thing you could change about MIT. What would it be? Uh, I'm not sure I would change anything about MIT. I mean, I, I feel like the uh, the amazing thing about MIT is the flexibility that it, it can adapt to the change of circumstances, to the need of um, of of people. Uh, I think, I mean, we we are surrounded by brilliance in so many ways and uh, understated brilliance, which makes it that much more comfortable to be around. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, I guess that the one thing I would change is uh, if I can avoid stress on students, I would, I, would, I would do it if I knew how to. Um, mm. And maybe all we need to do as faculty is keep repeating it, uh, telling them that, you know, it's good enough that you're here. Don't be lazy. Don't be a slacker. You know, have a good time. But at the same time, you know, don't be stressed about it. I mean, we, we know. That's great. My last question is, um, is a fill in the blank. And it's um, MIT is. <laughs> You know, uh, after what I just said, extraordinary in so many ways. Uh, can you, can I, I, you do I it, you just do it in a sentence for me, just for fun. Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, I MIT is a hubbub of 
ideas and innovation. Um, I think MIT is the place that will redefine of what tomorrow will bring.